welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to announce His Excellency Abdul Rahman Owais, Minister of Health and Prevention uh, of the UAE. And uh, we will look at the, at the video that he submitted. Sahabat al Sumu, Sheikh Jawahar bint Muhammad al Qasimi, Haram Sahab al Sumu, Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Muhammad al Qasimi, Udul Majlis al Ala al Tihad, Hakim Imarat Sharika. السيدات والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسرني أن أشارككم اليوم افتتاح الدورة الثانية لمنتدى مكافحة سرطان عنق الرحم وأن أستهل كلمتي هذه بجزيل الشكر وعظيم الامتنان لصاحبة السمو الشيخة جوهر بنت محمد القاسمي على دعمها المتواصل ولا محدود لقطاع الصحة والشكر موصول لجمعية أصدقاء مرضى السرطان على جهودهم وعلى إقامتهم لهذا المنتدى الهام الذي يهدف لتكثيف الجهود الوطنية حول مكافحة سرطان عنق الرحم ويأتي انسجاما مع إطلاق منظمة الصحة العالمية لاستراتيجيتها الرامية لتسريع وتيرة التخلص من السرطان وصولا إلى مستقبل خال من سرطان عنق الرحم السيدات والسادة الإمارات العربية المتحدة لها جهود كبيرة في مجال تحقيق أهداف التنمية المستدامة وضمان تمتع الجميع بجودة حياة وأنماط عيش صحية ورفاه لجميع المراحل العمرية إضافة لجهودها في الحد من الوفيات المبكرة والناجمة عن الأمراض غير السارية ومنها السرطان حيث شهدت منظومتنا الصحية تحسنا ملحوظا من حيث الوقاية وخدمات الفحص والتشخيص والكشف المبكر والخدمات العلاجية والرعاية التلطيفية ذات الصلة أخواتي وإخوة الحضور وفقا لمنظمة الصحة العالمية يعتبر السرطان ثاني سبب رئيس للوفاة وتعزى إليه وفاة واحدة من أصل ست وفيات على الصعيد العالمي في عام 2018 سجلت المنظمة 18.1 مليون حالة سرطان جديدة في جميع أنحاء العالم ويتوقع أن يصل الرقم إلى ما بين 29 و 37 مليون حالة بحلول عام 2040 أما في دولة الإمارات ووفق آخر إحصائيات للسجل الوطني للسرطان المعتمد في عام 2017 فقد تم رصد 4299 حالة سرطان منها 2250 حالة سرطان مكتشفة لدى النساء شكل سرطان عنق الرحم منها نسبة 3.64% من إجمالي عدد حالات السرطان الجديدة بين النساء هذا وبالرغم من أن سرطان عنق الرحم يعتبر رابع أكثر أنواع السرطانات شيوعا بين النساء على صعيد العالم والسادس على مستوى الدولة إلا أنه من السرطانات التي يمكن الوقاية منها كما أنه قابل للشفاء إذا ما اكتشف في وقت مبكر وتم تقديم العلاج الدقيق والناجع له بفضل الرؤية الثاقبة والاستباقية لحكومتنا الرشيدة تم إطلاق حزمة من المؤشرات الوطنية ومنها مؤشر أمراض السرطان تمتاز هذه المؤشرات الوطنية بكونها بعيدة المدى وتقيس النتائج الرئيسة لأداء الأولويات الوطنية وتحظى هذه المؤشرات بمتابعة دورية من قبل قيادتنا الرشيدة في الحكومة بهدف ضمان تحقيق أهدافها وضعت غايات لتحقيق المستهدفات واستثمرت باستراتيجيات وطنية وقائية وبرامج صحية وتوعوية للوقاية من أمراض السرطان ولتقليل العوامل الاختطار وتعزيز أنماط الحياة الصحية لأفراد المجتمع بالإضافة للكشف المبكر عن السرطانات الأكثر انتشارا في الدولة ومن ضمنها سرطان عنق الرحم بما يحقق التغطية الصحية الشاملة ورؤية الإمارات 2021 في عام 2014 بدأ البرنامج الوطني للكشف المبكر عن السرطان من خلال توفير خدمات الكشف في جميع المراكز الصحية التابعة لوزارة الصحة وقاية المجتمع والهيئات الصحية الأخرى وفق أحدث المعايير العالمية المعتمدة للتشخيص والكشف المبكر عن السرطان بالإضافة لبناء القدرات لكوادرنا البشرية العاملة في هذا المجال كما تم توفير لقاح سرطان عنق الرحم في عام 2018 وتم إدراجه ضمن برنامج التحسين الوطني وفقا لتوصيات مركز مكافحة الأمراض والوقاية منها وتعد الإمارات من الدول السباقة في المنطقة في توفير لقاح سرطان عنق الرحم 
بحيث يعطى كجرعتين لطالبات المدارس عند سن الثالثة والرابعة عشر كما تجدر الإشارة هنا إلى نسبة التغطية باللقاح على مستوى الدولة تصل إلى 82% من الفئة العمرية المستهدفة الأمر الذي يجعل دولة الإمارات من أوائل الدول على المستوى الإقليمي والعالمي في الوقاية من سرطان عنق الرحم حضورنا الكريم إن زيادة الوعي لأهمية إجراء فحوصات الكشف المبكر عن الإصابة بسرطان عنق الرحم ودورة في خفض معدل الوفيات بين الإناث في الإمارات العربية المتحدة لمن الأهمية بمكان وهو محور تركيزنا وجل اهتمامنا حيث تعتبر التوعية الصحية بمسببات سرطان عنق الرحم من الوسائل التي يجدر بنا الاستثمار بها إضافة للتشجيع على أخذ لقاح سرطان عنق الرحم ختاما نجدد شكرنا لصاحبة السمو الشيخة جواهر بنت محمد القاسمي وجمعية أصدقاء مرضى السرطان وكافة القائمين على هذا المنتدى وكافة المشاركين ونشدد على أهمية تضافر الجهود الدولية والوطنية للتخلص من سرطان عنق الرحم ونؤكد التزامنا بتحقيق مجتمع صحي آمن لكافة المواطنين والمقيمين على أرض دولتنا الحبيبة أتمنى للجميع حضورا طيبا ومشاركة مفيدة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you very much for these inspiring words, um, uh, His Excellency Alois. Uh, next up is a panel on how primary health care is providing screening, prevention, and access to HPV vaccinations under the current COVID pandemic. And I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Suleiman Abu Sawil, head of the International Vaccines Committee at the Ministry of Health of Libya, who will moderate this panel. And Dr. Suleiman, um, I would like to suggest that for this particular panel, we maybe start with Mr. Elias. Uh, hello and uh, good afternoon. And uh, it, it is my privilege and honor that you invite me to chair this session, which sounds to be very interesting. And the session will start now. And it is entitled How Primary Healthcare is providing screening prevention and access to HP vaccination under the current COVID pandemic. Uh, this session will uh, compose of four speakers. Each speaker will uh, stick to the time, which is 10 minutes, and we'll have about uh, 10 minutes or so uh, for discussion and the end of the session. So I'll call upon the first speaker, which will be Dr. Uh, Hussein Iran. He's, a center, he's Assistant Secretary of the Health Center and Clinical Sector. Ministry of Health and Prevention uh, of, uh, from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Dr. Hussein, you can take the floor, please. Uh, doctor, uh, Dr. Hussein has unfortunately not joined yet. We are expecting him in a bit, but maybe we can continue with the next moderator. Well, yes, yes, that, that would be okay. Then we'll call Abun uh, Elias Asrof. Is a senior policy officer, pictures is about the pictures is control Ministry of Health, Animal Fair and Sport, the Kingdom of uh, Netherlands. So, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Ilias, please, you can take the floor. Thank you, Doctor, for, uh, for, the in for our introduction. Uh, my name is Ilias Asluf, and uh, I'm asked by Rode to contribute to this firm, and we are very honored to contribute with this presentation. Um, I'm a policy officer at the Dutch Ministry of Health, um, Welfare and Sports, and in, in my function I'm responsible for the rollout of vaccination, and in particular the HPV vaccination uh, into our national immunisa immunization program. In 2008, the HPV vaccination was introduced in the Netherlands, and I'm more willingly to share our lessons learned. But first, my colleague Jos Joske Hoes, from the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment will tell you something about the facts and figures of HPV in the Netherlands. Joske, you can take the floor. Thank you, Elias, for this introduction. Um, yes, if we could continue to the next slide, please. And I will first start with some facts on the human papilloma virus in the Netherlands. Uh, well, as we all know, HPV is a sexually transmitted virus 
And uh, it is estimated that in Western countries, about 80 to 90 percent of all sexually active people will get infected with HPV once in their life. Uh, the majority of those infections is cleared naturally by the body, but a limited percentage may uh, be persistent infections and may uh, cause disease, including genital warts and several types of cancer, uh, including anal genital and uh, oral pharyngeal cancers. And if we then look more specifically at the incidence of HPV-related cancers in the Netherlands, we see that every year about 1,000 women and 300 men uh, get diagnosed with HPV-related cancer. And about every, every uh, year, 450 women and 150 men die of HPV-related cancer. If we could go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, but we do have implemented uh, the HPV vaccination in the Netherlands, as uh, Ilias has already mentioned. We introduced this into our national immunization program following a positive advice of the Health Council in 2008. We started off with a uh, catch-up campaign in 2009 for girls aged uh, 13 to 16. And uh, then from 2010 onwards, it was really included into the regular program for girls aged 12 in the year they turned 13. We, use a th we used a three-dose schedule um, and we have been using the bivalent HPV vaccine, so protecting against HPV 16 and 18, um, which is provided free of charge. In 2014, we then uh, changed towards a two-dose schedule following the positive advice of the European Medicines Agency. And um, uh, well, we've yeah. continued that ever since. Mm -hmm. And in 2019, mm -hmm. there was then another update from the Dutch Health Council uh, in which uh, the boys vaccination was also recommended. Yeah. We um, uh, have been uh, using mass vaccination, which is organized by the Dutch Youth Healthcare, and it's uh, introduced in sports halls. And since 2018, there's also been a catch-up campaign for uh, girls aged 14 to 16 years who did not respond to the first call. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. Then we can also look uh, to the participation in the, to the HPV vaccination in the Netherlands. Um, and as you can see from this graph, um, we have not been an, having an optimal uptake over the last years, which is here provided per um, year of birth in which the, uh, the girls that were eligible. Uh, the yellow line is here providing the uh, girls that has completed the full series. <clears throat> and uh, well, it has been fluctuating between 50 and 60 percent with a little decline over the last years. Uh, and in, in the uh, last reported year, we observed an increase again, uh, but there's still some room for improvement there. Um, next slide, please. So, Ilias, you will take over from here. Yes, thank you, Joske, for the for the introduction on the facts and figures. Um, something went wrong uh, at your side, but also at mine side. Uh, my my, uh, my internet is falling out, so uh, I'm hope I uh, I'm uh, well understood. Um, I will tell you something about the lessons learned in the policy side in the Netherlands. And um, if we look at how uh, the uh, vaccination is introduced in 2008, uh, we asked the health council for an independent uh, advice. Um, and they um, have uh, done this uh, based on several criteria, such as disease burden, effectiveness, safety of the vaccine, uh, and so on. Um, this uh, is, uh, advice is, has been offered to our government. And within three months, we uh, respond to this, uh, to, to, to this advice. Um, in which we said we will take this advice over and we will start vaccinate girls uh, in the age of 12, 13 year. Um, we ask uh, the colleagues of Joske to, um, to, uh, uh, to, to make an implementation plan um, and uh, do this together with a Dutch youth healthcare. Um, the implementation plan um, is based on uh, several things like vaccine procurement, vaccine log logistics, uh, the education of healthcare professionals, 
but also uh, in public campaign and communication materials. And uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, if this uh, implementation is uh, uh, broken, if it's uh, um, adapted by the several stakeholders, then uh, it takes uh, like one year to uh, get the vaccine implemented and that's the moment when we will start with the first vaccination so that will that the uh, it takes approximately one year to go through uh, um, the whole road for uh, taking up a vaccination in the national immunization immunization program next slide please um, the lessons learned in the Netherlands um, are, um, yeah, are, are very diverse. Um, at the beginning um, of the introduction of the vaccine in 2008, we saw a lot of mis- and disinformation in the Netherlands. And this, this was caused by uh, a group of people who uh, didn't, um, didn't, um, um, they, they were just against the vaccination because it was new, they didn't know what it will do, so um, they were against it, uh, but also healthcare professionals were, uh, professional were against uh, the vaccination and they gave their opinion in several talk shows on national uh, TV. Uh, this resulted in a very low vaccination coverage uh, and of this we learned that it is, that it is important to strengthen patient organizations interest groups and other societal stakeholders uh, to bear against this uh, kind of mis- and dense information. Uh, we also see that it is important to create uh, awareness about the disease or, or disease burden, uh, to involve healthcare professionals as they are the people who uh, other people believe, and also to pay extra attention to minorities like uh, religious people or people with a low social economic status. Um, the vaccination is introduced in 2008 and nowadays we see still a very low uh, vaccination coverage, as Joske said. Um, and therefore we are now focusing on, uh, on, um, on being more open for parents with questions and hesitations, improving conversation with parents by healthcare professional and adapting communication uh, mat materials. Um, these focus points, these lessons learned are based on the research and uh, other um, uh, in, uh, ways of input like conversations with uh, parents in uh, by the Dutch uh, health youth care. Um, for the future, we are focusing uh, on expanding the HPV vaccination uh, to boys. Um, we also want to lower the vaccination age from 12 to 13 to 9 years. And we will start also with an additional program for 18 to 26 years. This all is based on uh, a separate independent health advice uh, of the Health Council in the Netherlands. We started this implementation and, it's, and we hope that we will uh, start with this uh, expen expansion of uh, the program in uh, 2022. Next slide. This was our presentation um, and I hope that you can learn something about the lessons learned here in the Netherlands. Thank you. Uh, is, uh, is Dr. Hussein around? Uh, no, so I think uh, we, 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 we is Dr. Hussein around? Or shall yes. we Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. If it's Dr. Hussein around, please take the take the uh, take the, uh, the that form, and uh, uh, you will be delivering your talk. Okay, Dr. Hussein Rand. Yes, uh, Dr. Hussein Rand from the United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's my pleasure to join you today. First of all, I want to congratulate uh, Her Highness. Sheikha Jawahir for receiving the MD from the uh, Sharjah University for her work in humanitarian and uh, cancer protection as well as fight against cancers. Uh, 
my presentation will be around uh, cervical cancer in United Arab Emirates. Uh, cervical cancer is one of the most common types of cancer among women in the United Arab Emirates. Unfortunately, it is one of the most preventable cancers. The National Cancer Program at Ministry of Health and Prevention provide comprehensive and structured screening program for the population for early detection of priority cancer, including cervical cancer. National Cancer Screening Program have been set up to reduce disease mortality, to reduce likelihood of child of cancer, and obtain better treatment outcomes. At the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, elective medical procedures were suspended, including early detection program of cancer. In order to prioritize urgent needs of healthcare services, reduce risk of spreading COVID-19 in healthcare setting and limit screening to urgent cases or those with risk factor for cancer. However, with preparing for the recovery phase and easing restriction, many healthcare facility began to introduce early detection procedure for cancer again, after careful consideration of risk and benefit of cancer screening, implementing the appropriate preventive measure to ensure safety for both patient and healthcare worker. Therefore, a specific framework has been developed for cervical cancer services delivered during COVID pandemic. In addition, some cancer, some center have been allocated to conduct the screening in each emirate until early detection services are resumed fully in all assigned health centers in accordance with the highest standard of healthy of health and safety. Despite pandemic, Ministry of Health and Prevention was keen to provide the HPV vaccine for school girls from the targeted group as vaccine contribute to prevent to prevention of human papillomatosa papilloma viruses infection, which is the main cause of cervical cancer. In regard, the Ministry of Health and in cooperation with the Ministry of Education have ensured continuity of providing the HPV vaccine to school girls through appointment system in educational facilities, applying the highest standard of health and safety and follow preventive measure to limit the spread of COVID. As a result, the HPV vaccine was provided to 82% the targeted girl, which is recorded achievement despite the current health circumstances. The ministry also attached great importance to health awareness effort and health education in order to raise community awareness of the risk factor for developing cervical cancer and encouraging women to undergo examination. Therefore, health awareness campaign continued to play their role in spreading awareness to the targeted group during the COVID-19 pandemic through social media platform and harassing technology capability to reach the largest number of community members. The Ministry of Health and Prevention play a major role in providing optimal health care to all citizens and residents in United Arab Emirates. The support of the effort of the World Health Organization in achieving the targeted uh, of the, uh, the target of the strategy to eliminate cervical cancer. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hussein, for your uh, clear presentation. Now I uh, can uh, call upon our third speaker, Dr. Dr. Perth uh, Pasu. He's a, he's a head screening uh, group. Uh, Early, his talk is entitled Early Detection and Prevention Section, International Agency for Research on Cancer at the Auspices of the WHO. 
Dr. Bertha, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Suleiman, for the kind introduction. Uh, can I share my screen, please? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, in a way, it is unfortunate that when the entire world was gaining momentum to work towards elimination of cervical cancer, we faced the worst public health crisis in our generation, which is in the form of the pandemic. And because of the pandemic, as you know, that uh, cancer screening programs have been badly affected with a 50 to 90% reduction in cancer screening, including that of cervical cancer being reported from the United States, from Australia, from many developed countries, having good quality data collection system. But then we need to understand how the COVID pandemic impacted the cancer screening programs, including cervical cancer screening in the low and middle income countries. So I will briefly present the results of a study that we very recently completed uh, from IARC. So this study has, uh, you know, it identi we identified 17 different low and middle income countries across the globe, as you can see on the map. And these countries belong to different human development index categories. We identified the cancer screening program coordinators or focal points of each of these countries and then invited them to participate in this study. In the study, every focal point of the cancer screening program was uh, first asked to complete a questionnaire survey and then they participated in, a, uh, in, -depth, in an in-depth interview. And as you can see in this map, you know, there you can see the red uh, lines. So at the time of the focus group, uh, uh, sorry, at the time of in-depth in interviews, that was in uh, uh, September, October, 2020, these countries having arrows looking up, they were having a, an increasing uh, burden of infection at that point of time. Rest of the countries, they were showing uh, 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 reducing uh, incidence of uh, COVID. So with this background, when we asked these program managers whether cancer screening was totally suspended for 30 days or more, you, know, you can see excepting Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, Brazil, and Iran, all the other countries, they said that the screening programs were suspended. Diagnostic services were suspended for 30 days or longer in all except Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, Cameroon, Zambia, Brazil, Sri Lanka, Iran, and Malaysia. Fortunately, except Bangladesh, India, and China, all the rest of the countries could, could manage to maintain cancer treatment services. We asked these uh, program managers to rate the, uh, the, the current level of services as compared to the pre-COVID situation. And, uh, we asked them to rate screening services, diagnostic services, as well as treatment services, as far as uh, cancer screening continuum is concerned. And as you can see, uh, almost all the countries they got impacted uh, screening was more badly impacted as compared to uh, cancer uh, treatment. So for example, in Bhutan, as you can see, there was almost no screening activity uh, as compared to the pre-COVID situation, whereas they could manage almost 100% of the cancer treatment activities as compared to the pre-COVID situation. Another interesting finding was that the countries with medium uh, human development index, they were uh, doing uh, worse than the countries with low human development index. We tried to understand the reason. It was essentially because at that point of time in these countries, the number of deaths from COVID was zero to two. So in these, these countries were still at the you know, bottom of the peak. We asked the program managers whether they agreed 
and how much they agreed with us that these five factors would be impacting significantly cancer screening services over the next six months at least. As you can see, uh, you know, the first uh, point we asked them was whether the individuals who are eligible for screening, they would be more reluctant to participate and that would affect the cancer screening programs. And as you can see, 33% of the program managers very strongly agreed. Their agreement ranging was between 75 to 100. And this very strongly ended, uh, agreed that reluctance of the uh, eligible individuals to participate will be a major factor. Some of them, 22% agreed, uh, highly uh, you know, uh, agreed to our proposition that non-compliance of screen positive individuals will increase. Similarly, overloading of the service providers because of less number of service providers, because of uh, their uh, uh, you know, uh, engagement with COVID-related activities will be again a major problem. Some of the countries, they responded that planned expansion of program will be withheld due to competing priorities. And this is going to be a major problem for, the, uh, for achieving the 90-70-90 WHO target. In fact, Bhutan was planning to introduce HPV-based screening in 2020, which they, uh, they, they withheld. Then screening programs will have less financial resources and there was quite a good amount of agreement towards that. But then there were a few silver linings in the cloud. There were uh, innovative mechanisms uh, that were introduced in the programs to ensure that the screen positive individuals undergo uh, for, for the management, those who are having precancers, cancers, they were appropriately uh, treated. So for example, there were countries that introduced online system for delivering the report or having teleconsultation to, uh, to, to counsel the screen positive individuals. Countries like Bangladesh, Rwanda, they moved towards screen and treat strategy from the screen colposcopy and treat strategy that would reduce the number of clinic visits substantially. Transport reimbursement for the screen positives was uh, provided in Rwanda and Zambia. And Iran planned to develop a few COVID free hubs where uh, uh, men and women with a, with a, with a uh, uh, positive screening test could come with confidence and get their diagnostic tests done. In terms of improving treatment services, Bhutan, Cameroon, and Malaysia, they went for dedicated hotlines, mobile apps to navigate the cancer patients. Special call centers were uh, set up or youth volunteers were used to assist the patients uh, in India. Bhutan and India, they provided free transport for cancer patients during the lockdown. And two of the Latin American countries, Paraguay and Brazil, they found this as an opportunity opportunity to de-implement their ongoing opportunistic screening and make their screening more population-based, more organized. And this is exactly what Lancet Public Health article, they predicted that this COVID-19 should be looked as an opportunity in spite of all the chaos and uh, havoc it is creating. Thank you very much. Uh, now I call up the speaker, which uh, will. Uh, well, I think Dr. Smith is the last speaker. Now, now uh, I think we will open the floor for uh, question and answers, please. Please, Dr. Hussein, do you want to, want to ask anything? Uh, from my side, nothing. I just hear the others. Uh, I would like to ask uh, other colleagues, how was the situation for the screening uh, in other countries, for example, which they, uh, they are in? How is there was screening uh, from primary health care during COVID? As, as you know, all the, during COVID, we have the shut, uh, lockdown and uh, there was lot of clinics was closed. Is that the same in other country or not? Uh, any of the uh, panelists wants to 
us answer Dr. Hussein questions? Hussein, yes. Uh, yeah. please, please go ahead. Yes, in the Netherlands, we also had the same problem um, during the screening um, and the lockdown. Um, we decided to uh, make the interval in which the um, yeah the target groups are invited to spend that over more years. So the outcome is that we don't um, ask uh, the people to come in five years, but it will be more. It will be later than five years. Thank you. Okay, there's there's a question from Dr. Jonathan. Almeida, uh, the question is, are there any recommendations for people who had had already their first sexual contact? What would be the recommendation? Any of our panelists wants to answer this question? Uh, in the Netherlands, we say, um, if you had your first sexual contact, uh, you can uh, you can you can be affected with the HPV uh, virus. Uh, that's possible, but the vaccination uh, of the vaccine also does uh, protect you against other HPV types. So take the vaccine. That's our that's what we say in the Netherlands. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, another question from Jonathan Almeida. He said, Libya had the advantage of introducing HPV vaccine since 2013, but we are still working on establishing a cervical cancer. This is true. I, I, had, I lead the vaccine program of Libya, and now we are vaccinating against HPV for the last eight years or so. We introduced the vaccine at the age of 15, and since last year, we went down to the age of 12. And uh, we made a catch up to uh, close the gap, so we immunized the 13 and 14. And uh, we are in the process of uh, establishing our uh, cervical cancer screening program. And we continue with the vaccine in, in the, uh, we continue with the whole vaccine program in Libya, hopefully in full uh, during the pandemic uh, time. Any other questions, please? Uh... Is it in Europe, uh, as my colleague, uh, our colleague from Netherlands, is it a compulsory vaccination program or not? It is not compulsory regarding no. cancer, cervical cancer. Is it a compulsory? No, it is a free choice of uh, our citizens, citizens to take the vaccination. But we try to give them uh, a lot of information, reliable information to uh, get the, them motivated to get the vaccination, but it's not mandatory. Uh, may I ask you, Dr. Hussein? Yes, please. Have you considered, have you considered immunizing boys yet in the United Arab Emirates? Uh, it is not yet, but it is in our plan. As you know, in, in Emirates, uh, in Emir Abu Dhabi Emirates now since 2010, the vaccination, uh, cancer, uh, cervical cancer vaccination. Uh, at the other Northern Emirates, it's since now three years. Uh, for the boys, it is under uh, uh, it is under plan in our okay. plan that to under consideration. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In Libya, we have taken the decision uh, to immunize boys as well, uh, but we are waiting for the proper time to implement. But it was taken the decision and it was endorsed by the government. Uh, there is uh, Dr. Shibil uh, Shabu. He is asking this question to everyone. Is the HP vaccine, if not free of charge, included in the health insurance scheme in your respective countries? I can answer on behalf of Libya, uh, all vaccine programs are free. Uh, the word reimbursement doesn't exist in our system. So even expatriate uh, working in Libya, they get all vaccines uh, and we're immunizing against 17 diseases so far. Anybody else want to, to comment on this, uh, on Dr. Shibel, uh, uh, questions? On behalf of the Netherlands, I can tell that we vaccinate to our national immunization program against 12 infectious disease. And these vaccines are, uh, are free. Um, if it's not taken up into our national immunization program, it's 
is uh, it is not free, so you will pay for it. Um, people has the choice to take an other vaccine, but they will uh, need to pay it by themselves. It could be that our health insurance um, cover that, uh, but that's individual. Uh, there is a question from the organizer. Uh, say, they say to me, some countries have expanded the HBV vaccination age group to mid 20s and mid 30s. Will that be a global recommendation in the future? What is the evidence around efficacy in older women? Anybody wants to tackle this question? I just will uh, take this question this and other way around. Please, please, uh, please. I, I, I am, uh, my background is I'm an otorhinolaryngologist. Good. And uh, during my practice, I have received one baby who is two year old with severe dyspnea and the strider. And I had to take him to the operation theater urgently that time. I have done laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy for him and I have found multiple papilloma around the uh, larynx and even uh, subglottic. So I removed that and uh, saved the child and everything. And after that, I asked the mother, during your pregnancy with this child, do you have any problem? She said, yes, I have papilloma, uh, HBB, and uh, the gynecologist has advised her to do cesarean section during the delivery, but she didn't obey that. So the delivery was through vaginal normal delivery. So the child during the delivery have acquired papilloma virus and from the cervical papilloma. So this, is, this means that I think in the future, one should think in older ages who didn't have the vaccine. This is my opinion. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussein. There's another question uh, from Rod Jason. Uh, she says, Dr. Suleiman, uh, another question from the, uh, for the question and answers. What should be the best cost-effective intervention to start with at the low-income countries suffering from humanitarian crisis, the introduction of vaccine over the screening program uh, or the or screening intervention first in order to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer. Uh, anybody want to tackle this question from our audience or our... Uh, uh, I would say one, one uh, small uh, intervention that that I think the EMRO region should uh, put that uh, as a recommendation for all EMRO countries uh, to introduce uh, cervical cancer uh, vaccination. It is uh, in the United Arab Emirates is in our vaccination program. Uh, now, Olivia, uh, uh, HPV vaccination program is part of our expanded immunization, immunization program. It is a compulsory and it is made by law. So everybody, we started at the age 15, now we are delivering it at the age 12, and it is for everybody. I think vaccines, unfortunately, are effective, but I think they are um, cheapest for the value of the vaccine because this is an investment. Uh, cervical cancer is not a uh, is not a joke, really, and it fits uh, women at the, uh, their productive life, uh, their wives and mothers, and I think, but I mean, economy again is a governing factor. I mean, people have to prioritize uh, the services. For us, it was easier to introduce the vaccine rather than to embark on the screening program, but we realize the screening program is also important. And uh, by doing vaccination and screening program detection early, I think uh, cervical cancer will go down and down. Any other questions uh, from the audience or from our uh, panelists or uh, uh, any, any other questions? Uh, there is another uh, question here that says, what would be the best cost effective intervention to start with? At the thing that's it. At, uh, to start with that the low middle, I think I read this question before. So just uh, 
uh, there's another question from Jonathan Amanda to say, is it or it is advisable to give the HPV vaccine to male patients? I think it is very advisable. I think if you can afford it, yes. And, uh, all um, countries who have good financial capabilities, they introduce the vaccine. It is very important. Boys uh, compose 50% of the population of the, this age group. And if boys are protected, girls will be protected uh, because I mean, even if uh, some girls don't get vaccinated, the boys are not vaccinated, then they are prone to develop the, uh, to, to take the virus. So it is advisable that boys also get immunized. How did you deal with conservative, harmful attitude from healthcare worker? How can you convince them of the benefit of the HPV vaccine? Uh, I think I think we experienced this when about years ago when we embarked on production, and we have to make a lot of uh, workshop. We have to convince the obstetrician as well because the obstetrician was very opposing, and uh, they say we are conservative uh, society. The sex is not uh, allowed unless in the context of marriage. But we know that uh, things can happen. So we, uh, we spent some time with them. And I think finally we convinced them. And some of them actually went to the extent to have one-to-one -one tutoring. But I think uh, for the last few years, we are, we are behaving uh, quite safely. Uh, I think we have to allow for, uh, because you see, in our society, uh, if you talk about sex, it is, uh, you talk about taboos. Yeah. But not, that's, not, that's not the case, really, because this is a, a very serious issue. And I think we have to face it and, uh, and we have to deliver very clear and good uh, messages to the, to the public so things will work. And uh, thank God things are working okay for, for the time being. I will just add one more thing during uh, for this point, that yeah. there's a lot of people against vaccine. So they initiate rumors and these things. And we, when we have uh, introduced this vaccine in United Beverage, we faced a lot of uh, these uh, rumors and these things. Yeah, that's, uh, that, 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 that's very true. And, uh, uh, and I think we have a lot of people, uh, they, they, they're misunderstanding uh, some of, and I know some of the doctors, they say, well, the, this vaccine also is for prostitution. I think it's like, yeah. it's like it is. Um, I think once we are clear about the benefit, and I think this is a very deadly disease, and it affects young uh, women at their, their very important uh, part of their life, their productive life. And I think, uh, um, like preventing, preventing any other virus, I think uh, preventing, preventing cervical cancer thermalization is, is, is a good thing. And I, I myself am very happy that we have a vaccine which is very effective to, uh, to a large extent. So uh, I think uh, I think just we have to to be clear and we have to deliver a clear message. And I think in uh, I think under all circumstances, people will accept what is beneficial for them. Yeah, I uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Suleiman and Dr. Hussein. Um, uh, we also had in the Netherlands a lot of rumor, a lot of misinformation and disinformation at the introduction of the vaccination. Uh, this uh, resulted in a low vaccination coverage. And what we did in the Netherlands uh, was trying to give um, healthcare workers, but also parents, uh, uh, children uh, uh, of uh, information about the disease. So we told them how severe cervical cancer is and what it will do with you. Uh, but we also told them um, how effective the vaccine is. So we gave, we gave them a lot of information and based on that information, they could make a choice into vaccinating or not vaccinating. Yeah. That, that, that's okay. I think you have always to give the, uh, you have always to give the people choice. You cannot, you cannot make it compulsory, but I think if the, the messages are clear, uh, I think you find most people uh, will accept your idea. We are living in a society, some of the people, they will say no to everything. So there's no way that you argue with them, but the majority will, will follow the uh, clear instruction. Yes, indeed. And that's why we are also focusing on the majority 
uh, and not only minority who is saying vaccination are, are not effective or that kind of rumors. We are living in a society, in a society that is different. They are vaccine, they are vaccine skeptics in any society. And I think that's, we just have to, to live with it. Uh, but, uh, the goals and the, the mission with vaccinology is quite clear. Any other questions from our respected audience or panelists or uh, any other questions? I think uh, in that case, uh, we are reaching the end of our session, which was very uh, nice. Hello. Hello. Uh, 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 okay. Hello. We hear you. Yes, I think we uh, will come to the end of our session, which was entitled "How Primary Healthcare." Uh, uh, how how primary healthcare is providing uh, screening, prevention, uh, and access to HIV vac vaccination under the current COVID nineteen pandemic. And uh, we had about four speakers. Uh, all of them actually delivered very comprehensive, frankly, talk. And the discussion was nice. And I would like uh, to thank them all on the behalf of the organizing committee and myself and wish them all the best. And I uh, close up the session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Suleiman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Abu Sawil. Merci beaucoup. Uh, it was very interesting to hear from the situation in the Netherlands and the UAE and also seeing the dramatic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on access and availability of cervical cancer uh, services. And what really stood out for me is that, you know, although the contexts are completely different, there definitely are certain lessons that we can learn from each other and that we can maybe in the future integrate uh, in the ongoing national programs. Um, now we would like to continue uh, with the panel two under the continuum of uh, care uh, with the title, how to ensure uh, equity and access in cervical cancer care from continuum, including chemotherapy to palliative care for better outcomes. This will happen under the leadership of uh, Dr. Khaled Asala, the General Secretary of the Federation of Gulf Cancer Control from Kuwait. Doctor, the floor is yours. Is my voice is clear? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the President all the, the, the people who prepare for this uh, great uh, meeting. And we will start our, our time for this uh, talking about a very important issue actually, which is related to the carcinoma of the cervix. And uh, here, uh, this panel uh, title about how to be sure that the quality and the access in the Zervica Council and care from continuous, including chemotherapy to palliative care for better outcome. Uh, the first panelist will be Dr. Alemia uh, Safaidin. Dr. Alemia Safaidin, uh, I have uh, her resume here with me, and uh, she is a senior officer of cancer control in Abu Dhabi Public Health Center and she's been having her uh, master's degree certificate by the National Public Health Professional Board Examiner in Washington, D.C. And she has uh, the John Hopkins trained in the United States. She is having accumulating more than 15 years of experience 
on the health care management and the quality control. And she is also one of the planners and the creative uh, thinking they have, and one of the main establishments of law prevention and control session within the communicable, communicable disease. I welcome Dr. Alamia Safaidin to starting her first panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Khalid, and uh, uh, hello, everybody in the panel. It's uh, being a very nice time that from the beginning, with sharing experiences from different um, all over the world regarding the cervical cancer. So everybody hearing me, we all? Yes, it's clear. Okay, so I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. No? Sorry, not yet. Yeah, okay. starting, yeah, I think it will be shown here. Uh -oh. Okay, now. so I will be speaking in general about um, Abu Dhabi experience regarding uh, uh, cervical cancer uh, prevention and control. And um, I will touch base on whatever we have done uh, uh, since 2008, when the cancer word, as everybody mentioned that it was a taboo. At that time, it was a very difficult time to speak about um, cancer itself in general, or to speak about uh, uh, um, cervical cancer or the vaccine itself, all this information was like a very, very, very sensitive uh, topics to, to speak about. So uh, in general, I will be talking about um, uh, our plans, what do we have done, uh, what is our indicators and where we reach with the cervical cancer. As mentioned with uh, Dr. Hussein Arant, we started um, earlier in 2008, um, the HVV vaccine. Uh, our section, the cancer prevention and control section, we tried our best to put uh, effective programs uh, to tackle cancer in general and uh, cervical cancer is one of them, one of the top cancers. Actually, we started with the breast cancer uh, cervical cancer, uh, colon cancer, and lung cancer. Now we established the program. So we do our best that we, we make sure that there is, uh, there is awareness programs, uh, people that have the right information, there is uh, people have um, accessibility to the screening. Everybody in uh, Abu Dhabi Emirates have the right to have the screening. And at the same time, if there is any cases of cancer, we guarantee that the people receive the right treatment. So cancer control, as we all know, is not only one step, it's not only screening or vaccination, it's a continuum of care, it's a different uh, kind of um, uh, actions that we take together at the same time and equally to reach to uh, reduce mortality from cancer. This is what we do exactly in uh, our section. Uh, having a glance, uh, in 2008, um, the number of cases at that time was 45 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer, but unfortunately, 70% of the cases were at a later stage. In 2011, the number of cases was around 50 to 55. 70% uh, of the cases, as I mentioned, that were all at a later stage. So we knew that without taking any action, these numbers are going to be increasing. At that time, we decided to take uh, the HVV vaccine as a pilot, one of the pilot countries. Cervical cancer was the second cancer after breast cancer. It was 7.2% in terms of its incidence. So as we mentioned that we have to, if we wanna tackle cancer, we have to have the all kind of uh, steps that together to, to make it possible uh, from prevention, vaccination, and um, awareness to reduce the risk of cancer from smoking uh, and other things that we know it's related to cancer. The second thing that 
Uh, we have uh, early detection or, and screening programs, diagnosis, treatment. We have to have a specialized center. We have to make sure that the people that were screened, they were like referred to treatment and management. So it, there was a lot of work uh, started in 2008 where, where everything was, as I said, very difficult. The word cancer was a taboo. Everything, um, the, the data information were de very difficult to uh, collect because at that time we didn't have an electronic system. We established uh, in 2008 um, a school-based program, HBV vaccination. It was for um, grade 11 because uh, we, we had to, to find out what is the best time to give the vaccine. And we found out that women get married at the age of 18. So uh, women are sexually active here, uh, as, as we know that when they get married. So we decided the age of um, uh, 17, uh, between uh, 15 and 17, which is grade 11. Uh, in 2013, we started a catch-up cohort from 18 to 26 to make sure that we uh, uh, we catch the, 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 the girls which missed uh, the, the vaccine at school. It wasn't uh, a nice start that now we shifted, like um, it was a quadrivalent, now we shifted uh, at the age of 13 for a nine valent vaccine uh, recently. And uh, we put the screening guidelines and as the data that we have, uh, our screening guidelines is uh, starting from the age of 25 to 29, pap test every three years and 30 to 65 pap test and HIV, BV, uh, other co-testing every five years. Was it an easy to establish the vaccination program? No, it was a very challenging time. Lack of community education, myths, wrong information, media, anti-vaccine uh, movements, uh, the conspiracy theory, which we can see now. People are talking about the vaccine because it's going to make the girls uh, uh, infertile. It will cause problems for the girls. They're encouraging them to have sex. A lot of things that were going on. Um, the vaccine in, in private school was not free of charge. It was only free of charge in government school. Uh, they look, uh, there is a lack of school nurses at private school, healthcare professional meets. Um, at that time, healthcare professional were completely against the vaccine because the parents go and ask the, 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 the doctors and the doctors tell them that there is no need for the vaccine, that it's going to harm your, your girls. It's, there is no enough studies on the vaccine. So all these things together make a nice drop in the vaccine. Uh, from 2008 and 2010. It was really a big challenge for us as a team uh, establishing the program and we, uh, there was a lot of vaccine uh, not distributed. So we have to recalculate again and to start again to find solution for what happened. We started by more than 40 uh, credited CME hours for doctors workshops because we found that they are the, our first enemy. So we have to have uh, training for doctors, more than 150 partners came uh, together, six media campaign. Uh, the most important thing was the media people themselves. We did training to media people. We showed them the statistics, the numbers, the harm of the cervical cancer, because media were against us. They have all the myths and the wrong information, and they were putting this out. So the, uh, some people that they, they talk about it, there was the death of one of the girls in London. So people like took it and talk about it a lot. So to put a plan, we did the analysis, the duration analysis, and we found where is the gaps and we start tackling all these gaps. And I'm very proud to say it works. It worked that the vaccine went very high. Now we have one of the best uptakes in the region we reached to 98% of screening uptake, which is school-based, uh, which is uh, not, uh, um, it's, it's optional, uh, but the, the parents who are opting out, they have to sign a paper that they don't want to give their daughter the vaccine and they have to give explanation, but there is a very good acceptability now. People believe on the vaccine, people, and the myths now it's over, people believe that if there is one 
cancer that can be protected by a vaccine, this is a success. Because always people uh, regarding other cancers, they were asking, is there any vaccine to stop cancer? So we, we have it, we have it, so why we don't use it? Um, the good success that happened to us from uh, the, the past um, 10 years, uh, the cervical cancer with the second, now with the vaccine, with the, with, the, with, with the screening, it's now number eight from the second. It's number eight, only 2.8% we have uh, cancer uh, of the cervix incidence. The good, a nice thing that happened, there was a very nice staging shift. Before we have all the cases at the stage four, as I mentioned, now we have pre-cancer um, staging. We have a lot of cases, which is very minor uh, number, uh, which is at the late stage. It's not comparing with before, it's really, we consider it a, a success. You can see the down staging on the latest stage, which is a very uh, good um, thing that to show that we are on the right direction. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the screening uh, guidelines that we have, we put together, um, the most important thing to have um, a quality and to, to, to reach a successful uh, program. Um, we know that there is a population-based screening program and there is opportunistic. Opportunistic, that means whoever comes to the clinic that you offer him the vaccine. Population-based, that you mean you send invitation to everyone, you follow people, you follow um, indicators, you, you do all the things that uh, the people, it's going to be like invitation sent to everyone. This is a, a population-based, not just take the opportunity that a woman comes to the clinic and tell her about the vaccine. The benefit we know that uh, scientifically is very low comparing to the population-based uh, screening. And this is what we are doing. We are mandating uh, the, the services, the screening services that people, if they don't want to take the, the, the screening, they have to sign a paper that is, they are doing this under their responsibilities. Quality is very important. Quality indicators, performance, call and recall system, database, monitoring, effective links, uh, policies, guidelines, resources, healthcare professional trainings, awareness. This is all the things that we have been doing for the past 13 to uh, 12 years in the cancer control section in Abu Dhabi uh, Department of Health. Quality measures, it's very important that we put uh, quality measures. We, we audit the screening facilities. We make sure that uh, they are doing the right thing and the people life uh, are in good hands and in safe hands. We have to do always self-evaluation. We have to make sure that we have uh, database, data collection all the time, make sure that we are able to monitor because if you cannot measure it, you cannot fix it. Does the vaccine, yeah, yeah, this is my end of the slide. I can say one life matter. If this vaccine is going to save one woman and it's very expensive, I think it, we deserve to, to implement it. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Khaled. You can now introduce the next speaker, so we can have the next speaker present. Yes, can I? I, I think we are. I would like to first to thank uh, Dr. Lemia for her nice presentation, and uh, I'm calling the second uh, panelist, uh, which is Mrs. Uh, sorry, I forget. I, I will see. Just for one minute, okay, because the status is in front of me. Yes, the second panelist, uh, Professor Mastofa Banu Asso. I'm sorry if I pronounced the name uh, is not right, uh, Professor. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Mastofa. He is an, an uh, hepato gastroenterology from Rabat Medical School. And he is within the Muhammad University, the Hamish University of Rabat, Morocco. He was a hepatogastronologist 
uh, at the Tina Hospital in Rabat for 25 years. And uh, one of his honors is that he receiving the medical degree of uh, Casablanca Medical School at uh, Hassan Afani University in Morocco. And he is starting working in Medina. 1990, 1990, the Mustafa, Mustafa, he was made associate professor in internal medicine at Rabat Hospital. And he's uh, having a lot of uh, a long CV, but uh, at the end, he's uh, very expert in this field. I welcome the Mustafa to uh, start his manner. Thank you very much. Are you with me, the Mustafa? <laughs> the voice is not the, uh, can you try your voice the phone phone? hi mariam uh we currently can't hear you if you could connect to the headphones and reconnect with the audio please I, I don't know. Do, do you hear me? Me? Or the Mustafa only he has an issue. Uh, Khaled, we can hear you. Uh, we still not Mustafa get the uh, audio from. Uh, not connected. Uh, from Mustafa. So what I'm going to do is uh, I will request you to call on our next panelist. I would get in touch with Mariam and make sure that Dr. Uh, Professor Mustafa uh, presents after uh, Dr. Pizzo is done with the presentation. Let me put the slides for the next speaker. So you, they want us to shift to the, yeah. other, the third panelist? Yes, that is correct. And after which we will uh, address Dr. Mustafa. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. The, our, our third panelist, uh, actually, uh, I have here. I just want to The, the the second panelist, which is supposed to be the third one, but uh, Dr. Lisa Steven, she is PhD. Uh, Dr. Lisa Steven, she is joining the International Atomic Energy, IAEE, in June 9, 2019, as a director of Division of Program of Action for Cancer Therapy. She has a long experience and she has a, uh, also an experience as a partnership building and, and national capital performance plan developed and grew to, the, to her position. Prior to the joint to the agency, she is uh, having a 44 years of experience in various roles in the United States National Cancer Institute, the CI. She has also a long CV with a very much rich uh, career. So I welcome uh, Dr. Lisa to start her panel. Dr. Lisa, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I hear you clearly. Yes, fine. Great, thank you. So I think the organizers are gonna present my slides for me. So I'll wait. So um, I'll be talking about IAEA's role in accelerating action on cervical cancer. Once the slides are up. Dr. Lisa, give me a minute as I'm loading your slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, wonderful. You can go ahead and move to the second slide. Great. So the International Atomic Energy Agency has more than 60 years of experience assisting member states to improve radiation medicine. We have invested our own funds, more than 172 million euros to support cancer-related projects in member states, 
And right now we have around 115 cancer related projects with our member states. And these projects involve transferring nuclear technologies to address cancer. From the headquarters perspective here in Vienna, we also provide training both virtual and in person to support projects and the transfer of technologies. And I would invite you all to visit the IAEA's Human Health Campus for more information. Next slide, please. Oh, back one, thank you. So the program of action for cancer therapy really looks across the entire cancer continuum. And so I've got that listed here on the slide all the way from prevention through survivorship care. And I know the focus of this panel is really to look at this cancer care continuum. And we wanna ensure that there's a, a safe and thoughtful integration of radiation medicine into comprehensive cancer control because this is really the way to address cancer in a holistic manner. These activities support SDG number three and if I could just pay, um, spend a little bit of time on this continuum. So as you heard in the previous discussion um, about vaccination and, and screening, we wanna make sure that when, um, when a country implements a screening program, that there's access to treatment for both pre-invasive as well as invasive cervical cancer. Similarly, when a treatment program is implemented, we also wanna make sure that there's accurate diagnosis and staging. So these all play an important role. And I wanna talk about this in the context of both the Sharjah Declaration and the WHO um, Global Elimination Strategy for Cervical Cancer. So next slide, please. So the, some speakers previously today have talked about the Sharjah Declaration. So I just wanna highlight that there's the, um, the commitment to work collaboratively to strengthen health services. And this strengthening would include access to cervical cancer screening and treatment, as well as the uh, focus on empowering individuals. Also, there's the um, alignment with global initiatives, and I will talk about the WHO strategy. Also, the focus on capacity building and working with partners. So these are really daunting challenges that face us, and we know that a majority of the new cases and deaths occur in low and middle income countries, with one woman dying globally every 100 seconds from cervical cancer. So why is IAEA interested? Well, five of seven cervical cancer patients will be recommended for radiotherapy. And so we know that we have a key role to play. Next slide, please. I'm not going to review this slide as others have reviewed the targets for the global elimination strategy. However, I do wanna stress that these three targets, these three pillars do fit nicely into the cancer control continuum that I noted on the previous slide. And I do want to highlight under the 90% treatment uh, pillar that this really um, focuses on an area that the agency has technical expertise in, and that is access to radiotherapy, as this is a key curative treatment. Next slide. So this data was used in developing the, the pillars that were on the previous slide. And so I want to highlight some of this data from the Canfell et al. Lancet modeling paper. So across the top, we see globally that we are currently at 13 deaths per 100,000 women. The blue and orange lines in this graph model vaccination only. And so you can see a slow decline in mortality if we focus only on vaccination. However, I really wanna stress the green and purple models. And those models incorporate not only vaccination, but also access to screening and access to quality treatment. And again, this is important because it covers all pillars of the elimination strategy, the green and purple models, and it really looks across the entire cancer continuum. So when we think about treatment, again, IAEA can support member states to implement radiotherapy. And these, um, looking at all three pillars, will show a greater and faster decline in mortality. Next slide, please. So at the Program of Action for Cancer Therapy, we work closely with our partners at WHO and the International Agency for Research on Cancer to implement impact reviews. And impact reviews are assessments that we conduct with our partners that help guide both cancer control planning and also investments. Since 2005, um, with our partners, we've helped 93 countries to really look at their cancer care and cancer control capacities and we've um, begun implementing specific recommendations on cervical cancer. So I wanna highlight two recent examples. 
we were able to do impact reviews virtually in 2020. So that was a, a great step forward. And both Senegal and Mali requested that we incorporate specific recommendations on cervical cancer. And so for Senegal, um, the recommendations um, included this, not just limited to cervical cancer, but included looking at um, recommendation for a national vaccine campaign against HPV, and also a recommendation to strengthen the availability and accessibility of radiotherapy services. In Mali, there was a focus on cervical cancer and the recommendation was to strengthen the existing radiotherapy services, including procurement of a new linear accelerator, as well as a brachiotherapy machine, which is key in um, treating cervical cancer. So we do plan to continue integration of cervical cancer specific recommendations at the request of our member states as we move forward with future impact reviews. Next slide, please. So I wanna highlight a couple of key partnerships. Um, we work closely with UNAIDS and in fact signed a memorandum of understanding in 2020. And this partnership really focuses on the intersection of HIV positive women and cervical cancer. And this leverages the interest of each of, um, of these UN entities. Next slide. And I appreciate that both our director general who spoke in the opening session, as well as Nassim from EMRO mentioned the partnership that we have with the Islamic Development Bank. So this partnership seeks to support the expansion of breast and cervical cancer awareness raising programs, the development of national preventive and early detection programs, specifically in cervical cancer for prevention, training and education of over 100 cancer care professionals, Any issue? Sound is not to. Uh, Dr. Lisa, we are unable to hear you. Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Lisa? Sorry, I lost you for a minute. I lost my connection. The last slide, please. A second, now, okay. Great. So I just want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about the, the work that the agency is doing to integrate um, cervical cancer into, um, into national cancer control plans and the impact reviews. Thank you so much. I would like to thank you, Dr. Aliza. It is very comprehensive, actually, and this is encouraging information, as you see. And I always yeah, I appreciated the job of IEA in our region, and we hope that all our countries be part of this uh, IA uh, 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 action and, and the services. Thank you very much, Mr. Lisa. Thank you, I appreciate it. Now, uh, do Dr. Dr. Mustafa, Khaled, uh, we'll take questions till uh, we, we get connected to Dr. Mustafa. So you want to, you, we want to take a, a question now? Yes, please. Okay. Now I, I, I open the, the panel for, for questions, seeing that uh, Dr. Mustafa from Morocco faced some issues. So if there is any questions, kindly can. I may start with our panelists uh, taking the advantage to be a coordinator, uh, telling them about the vaccine, because this morning is a lot of discussion about the vaccine and the cost effective of the vaccine. So in the area like the Gulf area, which is the number of the carcinoma of the cervix in some country of our, of our country, it is the uh, number is very low. So do you, the, the, the expertise believe of the vaccine is justified in, as a cost effective for this uh, area? This question is uh, forward for both Secretary and uh, Dr. Lisa and, uh, and uh, our colleagues. Uh, so as, as I ended my slide, Dr. Alenia, and, yes, uh, yes uh, uh, Dr. Aliza, are you willing to answer the question? I actually yes, would is, defer Dr. to you because I think um, our, the focus of the agency is really on access to treatment and integrating. Okay. So I please please speak about the cost effectiveness of the vaccine. Okay, okay. So uh, as I ended my slide, uh, Dr. Dr. Khalid, that one life matter. 
So if this vaccine is going to you, to save uh, one life in a small population like uh, Abu Dhabi or UAE, I think it's not uh, it's, it's cost effective. So anything that can save life, can reduce mortality, uh, can reduce uh, women losing their uh, productivity uh, and affect their lives, uh, I, I think it's very important that if, if the country has the ability uh, and, and, and can uh, implement the program, I think it is cost effective. So one of the things that I, I, I have presented from the beginning that the number were, 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 were high because when we started even the program, there was the same kind of debates from doctors. We don't have a lot of numbers. So, okay, I, I showed that we have like 55 cases or, or, or 40 cases. That means there is cases, there is cancer. That means that there is a need uh, for, for, for action. So I think it, it was a very important uh, step that we have taken because breast cancer and cervical cancer was, uh, was the top cancers in Abu Dhabi. So it was cost effective, yes. Uh, Professor Benazou, I think we can hear you, but you sound very far away. Is there a chance that you can get a little bit closer to the microphone? Am I, am I clear now? You are clear, Dr. Khaled. Okay. So uh, if there is any question, any question, other question? Hi, Dr. Khaled, you are on mute right now. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, perfect. Uh, Dr. Khaled, we're still having trouble getting the audio from Professor Mustafa. So, uh, would request you, so you what do you suggest? What do you suggest? Do you want to, clo to close the panel or wait until Mustafa? Uh, if you could just give a minute, I'm trying to connect his uh, from his phone. Okay. Yeah. But uh, there is no questions for our panelists. No okay. further questions. Okay. Bear with me a minute. Maybe another question from the Q&A was if the COVID vaccine and the HPV vaccine can go together. Uh, I... Yeah. Maybe somebody can reflect on that. Yeah, maybe Dr. Lemia or Dr. Lisa can answer this comment. Again, Actually, yeah, I, I think Dr. Lisa also you can add to me, but uh, the targeted uh, population is completely different for us now for HPV vaccine, school girls at the age of 13. Uh, it's different from COVID-19 uh, targeted population, I guess. So we, we were not in a situation to choose or to uh, have studies or to, to know that it can go together. I hope this answered answer the question. Dr. Aliza, if you want to add anything? No, oh, nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Maybe an other question that was raised is uh, if a lady who has been diagnosed with a beginning tumor, can she still be giving the HPV vaccine? Dr. Khaled, you are muted. Can hear us from the meeting, right? Hi, Dr. Khalid. I have got Professor Mustafa on the phone. Uh, he's going to be helped yeah. by uh, Mariam to present the slides. Uh, he's sharing his screen. I'm sharing the audio from my phone. 
Uh, could you confirm if you can hear him well now? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can. Can you hear us right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, Mariam, we can hear you. So you can start with your presentation. Okay, okay thank you so much. And we are sorry for this uh, little problem. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be able to do this presentation on behalf of Professor Bensou. Uh We are going to talk about the impact of inequities in access to primary and secondary prevention of cervical cancer on patients' uh, outcomes um, from the experience that Professor is uh, having uh, in here in Morocco. Um, so uh, cervical cancer represents a major health problem uh, in Morocco. It ranks second among uh, the cancers that, uh, that affect women and causes high rates of mortality, which is similar to uh, the trends we observe in uh, the majority of low and middle income countries. So the reason why uh, we have this unnecessary high uh, rate of mortality uh, it is related to some uh, inequities. In this study we are sharing with you that has been done by Moroccan researchers. They tried to uh, assess the factors that cause this unnecessary uh, uh, mortalities and uh, we can divide these factors into two, uh, two types of inequalities. First one is related to, uh, to knowledge inequalities in access to education and knowledge. In this study, they found that the majority of women, uh, in fact, they do not have enough knowledge about the disease, about cervical cancer, about what causes this disease, the relationship between the virus and, uh, and cervical cancer. They do not have enough knowledge about the symptoms, about screening programs, and also about uh, vaccination. The second part is related to socioeconomic uh, factors. Uh, the, 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 late, the, the fact that women come late to seek diagnosis is also related to poverty, to the distance from uh, their uh, residencies to and the hospitals. Uh, there are also uh, women who reside in rural areas are less likely to seek diagnosis. So this leads to the woman being presented with cervical cancer most of the time at uh, very late stages where surgery is not, is not effective. Starting from stage 2B, the surgery is no longer effective. So patients come and uh, it is so hard to have favorable uh, survival and outcomes uh, for these patients. We observed in this uh, study that also 85% uh, of the patients are presented with, uh, with the tumors larger than four centimeters and the tumors have already invaded uh, most of the parameters. This, of course, affects greatly the survival rates which, uh, which is reduced by these parameters. So a late diagnosis will go to lead to a difficult surgery with more complications and by consequence to low survival rate. So in order to, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, these trends uh, are going to decrease in the coming years, uh, the Moroccan Ministry of Health, in collaboration with uh, the foundation of Her Royal Highness uh, uh, Lella Silma, Princess Lella Silma, uh, they elaborated a national cancer prevention and control plan. Uh, the first one has been uh, extended uh, during the last 10 years, and the second plan is uh, st started from 2020 and is going to be extended to 2089. 29, sorry. Uh, so there are three uh, parts of this program. The first one concerns the primary prevention, which is the vaccination. Uh, this plan has uh, an objective of the implementation of HPV vaccination starting from this year. 
in accordance with the, the objectives of the global plan to eliminate cervical cancer. Uh, this uh, vaccination is going to be introduced into the national immunization program with an objective of achieving and maintaining 90% vaccination coverage rate. Second part is secondary prevention. Uh, as for uh, screening programs, uh, the objective is to allow all eligible women the access to quality cervical cancer screening programs and to generalize these screening at the national level and also to adapt recruitment uh, mechanisms and uh, and uh, awareness uh, campaigns in order to increase um, the participation of these women in these programs and also to strengthen the treatment of precancerous lesions because it is not enough to only screen for cervical cancer but it is very very important to treat the lesions the precancerous uh, lesions also it is uh, very important to guarantee free and uh, free early diagnosis and treatment for these women it is also uh, in the objective to start implementing screening for cervical cancer by HPV tests. HPV tests will allow uh, uh, also the alternative of self sampling for women, which is going to increase their part participation, especially women that live far from uh, from uh, the hospital, and also to strengthen and computerize the information system to allow the follow up of uh, the women being screened for cervical cancer. Which leads us to the third part, which is treatment. In order to improve treatment of cervical cancer, either the precancerous lesions or advanced disease, it is important to increase the number of cancer treatment centers to be able to handle the increasing number of cervical cancer cases. Also, the, the human researchers, the, the practitioners need to be trained and to develop their skills uh, in, this, uh, in this area. And also, it is very important to in involve civil society to support uh, these uh, healthcare programs through uh, volunteering. All of this is to attend the objective of achieving 100% rate of diagnosis and treatment of new admitted cases to healthcare structure and to achieve a treatment rate of at least 90% of cervical cancer. Uh, to finish with, uh, this is a, um, a reminder of the values of the, this national program. Uh, first of all, uh, the first value being the equity through an identical provided health care for all the women and accessible to all the women uh, concerned. Second thing is solidarity and mutual participation uh, for guaranteeing health care for all the patients. Also, the quality for uh, complete health care that meets international standards and excellence and perfection in every stage of the implementation of these programs. This leads us to the end of this presentation, uh, and thank you for your attention. I, I would like to thank you very much, Sora. This is a very nice presentation. Are you hearing me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's okay. So this is a very fruitful presentation, actually. I am sorry that Dr. Mustafa, we cannot catch him uh, with us, but uh, it's, this is a nice presentation. You see this uh, uh, here. Now, all the panelists is, is giving us a good idea about the topic we talk about it. So, uh, do we receive any any questions by the email or by by direct submit? Do we receive any questions? Hi, Dr. Khalid. Uh, yes, we did receive questions. It's sent to you on the chat. Uh, if you can take a look at that. Okay. On the chat, I will see the chat. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, there is actually a question, but there is also a question here. So uh, there is a question we didn't answer uh, before. And uh, question at what month the young girl should start to take the vaccine? And at which month of pregnancy vaccine can be given to the patient? Uh, this is uh, just, uh, I, I read the questions. I don't think the vaccine is working with the pregnancy, the, uh, the, way the, the answer for them. And the third question is many daughter is 14 years and she did receive HPV vaccine at her school. My question is, there any vaccination program at school health in charge by the school? And how will the vaccine in uh, AD be affected as more, most students aren't going to school? So this is a whole question for our panelists. If we start with for Alimia or Lisa or instead of with Mustafa, kindly. The coronavirus is the question the clear the coronavirus. So the sound is not clear. I'm sorry, but the sound is not clear. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Do you hear the question? Uh, no, uh, can you tell it again, Dr. Khalid? I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I can read it more. Uh, there is a question about the vaccine, actually. One of the questions is related to uh, United Arab Emirates. Okay. Uh, they said, uh, at which month, no, at which month the young girl uh, yeah. Okay. The, 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 yeah. Yeah. The vaccine starts at the school and uh, on September, October, because this is the beginning of uh, uh, academic year. So usually, beginning mm -hmm. of the academic year, we take we give the first dose. Uh, before September, they give the numbers of the girls uh, at a school and they prepare the dose and they distribute it uh, between September and, and October and they take the second dose in the second term. And the last dose before uh, the end of the uh, last day, uh, before like June. Uh, sometimes yeah. because now we are going to we are shifting to nine balance, so it's only two doses. I, I think it's much better and easier. Uh, it will be only two uh, doses. Uh, you know, because of the now student is out of school. The question is uh, in Abu Dhabi. The particular mission affects. Yeah, we continue with. Yeah, we continue. School. Yeah, yeah, we continued. Yeah. Uh, we had it at the primary care setup. Uh, each school, they send the name of their students and uh, they call uh, and they send uh, text messages to the parents that um, they can come to a nearby primary care um, clinic and they can take the vaccine. So actually, yes, we, we continue with this, this year even. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't. This is also another question about a lady who diagnoses with benign tumor. This lady can be given an uh, HOV vaccine? It depends on the age. If she is within the criteria, because the criteria is from, uh, from uh, for the catch-up cohort from 18 to 26. This is this is where mm -hmm. the, the, the efficacy is very good. Other than this age, there is, yeah, she can take. Uh, if it's a blind tumor, it's not a problem. She can take it because it's still, she can, even even sometimes we give them if, if because they, we don't know what kind of uh, infection she had even so they take them take it they, they benefit from it yes. if no. she is within the uh, range of the age okay maybe uh, the, this question is addressed to uh, dr aliza if she hear me dr aliza i can hear you yes yeah. This is they are asking about the best cost effective intervention to start with the low middle economy and income countries. So, uh, what do you think that uh, the mm -hmm. best cost effective intervention for those countries who are either low 
income or middle income countries. Well, I, I know that uh, the, the HPV vaccine and, and HPV screening are both WHO best buys, but I just want to recall the, the data from the modeling study, which shows that the fastest impact on mortality from cervical cancer is if you look at vaccination, screening, and access to treatment. So I know that um, Dr. Lamia mentioned um, the presentation at stage four for cervical cancer. And um, so with, a, with integrated screening, but also access to treatment, we can help to reduce, reduce the mortality. Yeah. What about those companies who are in the uh, humanitarian crisis, which is now you know, particularly in the or Middle East countries, some, sometimes this is, this, they are finding in the middle of the war or something. So is there any role for uh, the international economy? Uh, Absolutely. Yes, we, we are working yeah, with countries yeah. that are that are in humanitarian crisis right now, working on either impact reviews or um, funding proposals for the Islamic Development Bank um, funds to be able to support comprehensive um, implementation of cancer activities. So yeah. I know. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So this is uh, this is a question for everybody that uh, either you know the behavior of the people among the, the, the vaccine either deal with conservative uh, harmful attitudes from the health worker you know uh, yeah which is I don't know. If we are having any experience of how to deal with with the people uh, the speed of start as a for, for health worker, and is there any training for health workers to be having an, uh, I mean, a good attitude among those who, who need to have a vaccine? You know, this is a general question. I just don't you have any comment on that. <clears throat> Maybe the problem here, yeah, if, if you can yeah, yeah, give us a uh, note actually, about the worker. Uh, Do you train yeah. worker when they are doing Yes, the yes, yes. Actually? In the beginning, as, as I mentioned, that we, one of the challenges that mm. we faced were the healthcare professionals themselves. They were against the vaccine. They were uh, advising parents against the vaccine. Uh, so we did like um, uh, CME training workshops. Uh, we did simulation sessions that to see them, uh, how they can counsel a patient when the patient come. Uh, like we put them in a room and, and someone pretend that he's a patient and when they, the patient come, how they talk, what they say usually. And we let the people um, watching and then they criticize the way that the doctor talk. If, 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 and, and, and the ladies themselves were trained ladies that they tell that, uh, how do you feel? Was he convincing? What he said was was good to you. Are you happy with the way that he addressed um, the, the 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 all everything about the disease, about the pap test? We do uh, lots of training because uh, we, so before we thought that the problem with the community and the healthcare uh, system was perfect and the doctors were perfect, but we did uh, kind of uh, surveys. Uh, knowledge attitude uh, surveys and we found that most of some of the doctors they don't have uh, that good knowledge about uh, cancer and how to handle it how to talk to the patient so we built our training based on that and it helped it helped a lot yeah. we changed I also I, I have to mention before Alenia there is a, a comment up they are actually appreciated what we do and they they mentioned that your your effort and your team is excellent. You spend an excellent effort in Abu Dhabi. This is uh, from our um, audience that they are, they are appreciated what you do, and I'm sure uh, you, you deserve this. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to to read this. It's mm -hmm. a very nice comments and encouraging. Because we always say that if we save one life, we have done a great job. So I think everybody here is doing a great job and can hear from everybody experience that people are doing a lot of efforts uh, really in, in the field of cancer. Uh, I want to thank everybody here because it's really a great job. And 
means a lot to the people. Thank you very much. So if there is no other questions, I didn't find any other question in the chat. I would like to thank very much our three panelists who are actually giving us a very fruitful information today. And uh, I appreciate their attendance and contribution with us. And also, I don't forget to thank the organizer and technical support that we find it. Some difficulty maybe, but they, they are building a lot of effort. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Remy, and on behalf of uh, uh, our colleagues from Morocco. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khalid, for running the session. It was great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. And again, it's the end of the day, but very interesting information was shared. Uh, in particular, I was very impressed with the presentation from the UAE and the five year period after rolling out the vaccines and that there were already very clear results. But also uh, the presentation from the IEAA that the best buy intervention is again the prevention, but that we have the best results if we address the entire continuum of care. And I also learned a lot from the, from the situation uh, in Morocco. And um, I'm not sure if it was visible to all participants, but Dr. Uh, Professor Mustafa looked like he was coming straight from the, from the operation theater. And I think this also shows the diversity of participants that we have available in this panel. That being said, I would like to hand over uh, to Dr. Sasson Al Mahdi and Dr. Shibo Sabani, who will uh, present the closing remarks for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robbie. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. So I think it was a very interesting day with a lot of information and very distinguished speakers. What do you think, Dr. Sasson? Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Shubel. I mean, um, it was never a dull moment throughout the uh, the whole day, uh, especially, uh, you know, the opening session, um, the amount of commitment from the leadership from all the uh, entities that was actually um, uh, contributing to the day opening session throughout the day as well. And uh, if you allow me, Dr. Shubel, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of uh, Friends of Cancer Patient, and I'm sure uh, for from your side and FPA sure. as our partner to extend my thanks to all the amazing speaker who was there with us today in the opening panel and all the rest of the panels, but most importantly to the audience. I mean, I just kept on asking my team how many people we have so far, how many delegates are still attending. And so far we have almost 200 people attending till now. So for that, I want to thank you all. And if anything, it shows that we have actually um, all our hard work to Shibel for the past 10 months has paid off with a very successful uh, right. forum. So Alhamdulillah, and thank you everybody. Over to you, Dr. Shibel. No, thank you very much. Yes, I echo what you said. And of course, uh, on behalf of UNFP as well, we thank all the participants. And I would like to thank also FOCP team for the great work that has, uh, has been done. Um, uh, of course, uh, we will have a recap uh, tomorrow morning, but I would like uh, to highlight that all today's session are recorded and will be uh, accessed through uh, the portal. Um, is that true, uh, Dr. Sassan? Yes, That's right. all. Yes, it is uh, all recorded today. You can access it in the resources. Um, and please, we look forward to seeing you today, uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, and if you liked what you heard, tomorrow is going to be also another exciting day. Uh, and we would like you to reach to your network and invite people to attend. You can join in still. There is still an opportunity to join in through our Friends of Cancer Patient website. Just go and do a new registration and you can actually join us for tomorrow. Uh, over to you, Dr. Shabir. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank you very much, colleagues. We uh, appreciate your feedback and love to hear from you. Please leave us your uh, uh, comments so we can add them in uh, our two morning uh, recap, as I said, for day one. And please don't forget to leave your name uh, and also the organization you are representing, if it's the case, so you can get the proper acknowledgement. Uh, tomorrow we will start at 1 p.m. UAA time. Please be with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shibel, and thank you, everybody. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Have a good evening, colleagues. Bye-bye.